Today, the RBA Governor, Philip Lowe, said in his first speech for the year that Australia's economic growth will remain largely unchanged despite the bushfires, following on from the bank's decision yesterday to leave the official cash rate unchanged at 0.75 per cent. Joining me now for our economics panel, experts on all of this and more, Adam Crichton, economics editor at the Australian newspaper. He's in Sydney. And Terry McCran, business columnist with The Australian and The Herald Sun, live here with me in Melbourne. I want to start, Adam, the issue of Tesla. Now, the stock of this uh, electric car vehicle and solar panel maker, it's rocketed to nearly $900 US, so it's a 30% increase in just the past two days. Now, it wasn't so long ago people were talking about the company headed for bankruptcy. Smoke and mirrors or fair income? Well, look, it is extraordinary. I mean, this is a company that still hasn't made a full year's profit, as far as I know, and I, I'm actually gobsmacked by the increase. I mean, the share of new car sales globally that are electric is something like 2%. I um, mean, Australia, I think it's about 0.2%. Uh, and the growth is still relatively slow. I mean, the, the, the idea that there's going to be a sudden takeoff in the US or Australia or indeed any Western country uh, without significant changes to the infrastructure is, is uh, well, is just foolish. I mean, for instance, just to give you one statistic, I mean, two houses next to each other uh, can't both be charging a electric car at the same time because of the demands on the network. So just imagine the cost of changing the transmission network. Yeah, and I read a yarn the other day about a bloke who was saying how, how fantastic the car worked out on a trip from Sydney to Melbourne, but it took an extra seven hours because of the stopping all along the way, Terry, to recharge. And it comes on a day that the UK government, Boris Johnson's announced he wants to get rid of any new purchases of petrol and diesel cars by 2035, which is not that long away. Well, I think that, excuse me, Peter, specifically tells us that a British Conservative is somewhat different to what we think of as a Conservative. I mean, they're somewhere left of left of right of centre. And they're a small island. And they're a small <laughs> island. But to, to go back to Tesla in the US, the last place that electric cars are going to take off in the world is in the US because they have very cheap petrol. Yep. Uh, they don't have the enormous taxes that we have imposed. They don't have the enormous taxes that the Europeans and the Brits have imposed. So I think that the, the two things are working in the context of Tesla. One is a short squeeze. People are shorting the stock. So when the market goes up and the market of Tesla goes up, they get caught and they have to rush in to buy. So there's been a short squeeze. But secondly, it's a sort of a version of Amazon where there's, as a Adam indicated, they haven't made a profit. There's a lot of expectation that they're at the cutting edge and we all want to be own some of that stock. So the, the expectations of electric cars and Tesla as, as the future has run way ahead of reality. And look, Musk isn't short on sort of uh, marketing chutzpah either, all so that. he's part of all of uh, the push for the stock, I suspect. Adam, what did you make of the RBA Governor's speech? Yeah, look, certainly it was a fairly optimistic speech, and I think the, the current pricing now for a further interest rate cut is out to September, when just a few weeks ago it was something like March was the expectation. So uh, the combination of the announcement this week that rates will be on hold, plus this speech, uh, have certainly changed the outlook for rates. I mean, the Governor's assuming a fairly big increase in the growth rate, from a 1.7% now to about 2.7% uh, this year. So that is, that is fairly optimistic. Uh, look. It's always uh, worth remembering that central banks have a structural bias to be optimistic and uh, historically they are too optimistic and, and their forecasts prove wrong. So we just have to wait and see whether, whether that proves the case this time. Are you optimistic? Uh, I think we can thank the Governor for being very transparent. He's told us exactly what the Reserve Bank thinks. I mean, as Adam indicated, there's a lot of hope in that, expect, that thinking that consumer spending will pick up. Uh, he's also made it clear that he doesn't think the bushfires are going to be a significant economic event across the economy. But we've got this big question mark over the coronavirus. Yeah, that's, and I think, more telling, isn't it? Exactly, and it's also much, much more short-term in the sense that we will find out in the next week to two weeks, I think, just how damaging it's going to be, obviously, as a virus, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but more, more, more importantly in this context, what it will do to the global economy, the Chinese economy and our economy. So the governor has basically said interest rate cuts are off the agenda if the upbeat economic forecasts come to bear. If they don't prove to be correct, if the coronavirus turns into something more dramatic, interest rate cuts are back on the agenda. 
Yeah, I want to tell you, Terry, I mean, we saw this week, obviously, Matt Canavan's going to leave the resources portfolio. He's well regarded by the industry. There's a report out by Deloitte, it's its annual Tracking the Trends report, and says a whole lot of issues, uh, social impact, uh, um, transparency, all of these things are dominating the AGMs and things that will come up in, in any discussion about mining sectors, uh, um, you know, policy questions. So it's not about the business of mining and resources anymore. It's about all of these extraneous, a, a lot driven by climate change politics, all these extraneous issues butting up against the price. Where do we go with mining, considering it's such a big part of our economy? Well, obviously, mining loses a champion in Matt Canavan not being around the, the cabinet table. He should be around the cabinet table, quite apart from his uh, he supports the mining industry and resources more generally. Uh, but he's a very good minister. I mean, he's, he's the future of the National Party and of right-wing politics. Um, on the AGM issue, uh, activists see AGMs as another avenue to try and change the society. Mm -hmm. I mean, they've been through the, all the institutions, politics, education, and they're now doing, doing it in the corporate sector. Adam, look, before we go, the RBA is concerned mm. that retailers are paying too much for tap and go. Now, I have to confess, I love tap and go. It's I do fantastic. like to see what number they've put on my little uh, machine before I hit it, so I'm not ripped off, but I love it. Now, what's the concern, and are we as consumers then getting the cost passed on to us? Well, look, we basically are. It's about $500 million a year which is being passed on to consumers. In the old days, before tap and go, you could press the debit button or the credit button. And if you press the credit button, it would be more expensive for the merchant because it would go through the Visa and MasterCard uh, set up and that would be a percentage fee of the value of the transaction, whereas if it was debit, it would just be a few cents. Now, the problem with the uh, tap and go is it just automatically goes through the, through the credit card button, if you'd like, and that means that the fee is a percentage of the transaction. And that's very lucrative for Visa and MasterCard when uh, the alternative is that it goes through the old FPOS network and simply costs the merchant a few cents. Yeah, look, at a lot of time, even if you uh, don't want to use tap and go, there is no longer the capacity to pass your card in the machine or to run it down the side. So, you know, they're making a lot of money here.